Almighty God, in the silence of this moment, we listen for your voice. There's so much noise about us. The pain, the suffering, the crying out for help. Lord, we come to listen to you. Speak to us, Lord. Speak to us of the peace that passes understanding. Speak to us of the great grace that reaches down and touches us with the overwhelming realization that through the blood of Christ we are forgiven. Speak to us today, O Lord, of the truth from your word that reminds us that as we look to you in prayer and as we come to you in faith, and that as we call upon your name in humility, you hear us as we pray. For you've invited us to come and roll our burdens on you. Many are the burdens, Lord, today of people facing this hour of disease and sickness that runs rampantly across our country. Oh God, we pray for those who are sick. We pray for the many who are spending extended hours of their life dealing with the sick for the doctors, the nurses, for all those that are supporting them and functioning that healing can be offered to people. In their weariness, may they find strength in you. In their frustration and anxiety, may they experience your peace. We look to you, Father, for help at this time. Not only for us, but for people around the world today. How desperate is the need. And we ask, oh God, that you would bless your church wherever it is found and by whatever name it is called, that wherever the Lord Jesus Christ is exalted, that there the power of the Holy Spirit would enable your community to respond to the needs of the people around them. We need your resource, O oh God. We need the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We need wisdom and discernment, and these are all the things you have offered to us because of Jesus Christ and through faith in him. For the members of this congregation, Lord, some who may be in nursing homes and others in hospitals, most confined to their homes, bring to them, Lord, a sense of your presence. And with that peace and joy, the assurance that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you, Father, for this great grace that is ours because of your Son, Jesus Christ. Enable us to walk in that grace and to be examples of your love to others around us. All of these things we pray in the strong and powerful name of Jesus the Christ, our Savior, who taught his disciples that beautiful prayer we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The message this morning comes from 
passage of scripture found in the first epistle of Peter. Peter writes to a people who are persecuted and a people that are struggling in their, for their survival as Christians in the very first century. And this is what he says to them. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of his son Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved for you in heaven who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. A great source of encouragement for us. Uh, Peter begins by saying, blessed be the God and Father. That's another way of just saying, let's praise God. Let's praise God. It's uh, sometimes not easy to praise God when things seem so difficult, when something comes around us that we can't manage, such as the current epidemic of virus. But Peter says to these people who are suffering and who are being persecuted, in the midst of all of that, let's give thanks to God. Because he says he's the one who has begotten us again to a living hope. Hope. There have been some studies done concerning the very dangerous areas in the heart of uh, many of our urban centers across the country in those uh, difficult places, murders, robberies, unthinkable things happening. And one of the things that they concluded as they've been gathering data is that a lot of this is the simple result of the fact that there are vast numbers of people who live hopelessly. When you have no hope, when you feel like you're condemned to be where you are and there's no way out, it's hard to predict how you'll behave. Hopelessness. And that's why at this particular time and juncture in our country, as never before, we need to declare to people there is hope. There is hope. And that's what Peter tells us here. Now this hope, he says, is the result of the fact that we're born again into this hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten you into this living hope. Begotten you. That's the phrase which simply means that this hope is not something, again, like we said last week when we discussed the matter of peace, something we conjure up in ourselves. I'm going to hope. Well, against all of the things coming at me, I'm going to hope. I'm going to try harder. No, no. God says, wait a minute. That kind of hope that you're talking about is not something you're going to generate. It's the result of the fact that you've experienced the life-changing grace of God through Christ. And in that, you receive hope. I'm confident, you see. I'm not confident because I think I can pull it off. <laughs> I know me too well. I can't pull it off. But he says, I'm going to be God you. I'm going to give you birth a birth into the kingdom, a birth into my family. And here through this new birth, you're going to experience hope. Now, I, I'd like to stop for about an hour or two, if you don't mind. Well, if you're watching this, you see on video, it doesn't make any difference. You just sit back and relax. 
I'd like to talk to you extensively about the fact that this new birth experience is such a powerful experience. So many people claim to be Christians because they're religious or because they try hard or because they pay their taxes and they treat their neighbor well. And yet if you ask them, have you ever experienced the grace of God that has changed your heart? They say, I don't know what you're talking about. And then they go on to say, well, I've always believed in God. No, that's nice. I'm glad you've always believed in God. Me too. But the issue of experiencing God's grace is not because you have believed in God. It's because God has operated upon you by his divine grace and has done for you what you cannot do for yourself through Jesus Christ at the cross you see, that's quite different than just being religious. It, though it's nice if you're religious, that's fine. But I'm talking about the fact that there is something that God does in us which is so transforming and so wonderful, it produces in us a hope. If he can do this for me, I can dare to trust him. If he can change my life in this way, I can be certain that he goes before me and that he can rescue me and enable me and, and cause me not just to survive, but he can cause me to experience the abundant life. And when that happens, there's a reason to hope. It's the new birth. I think probably one of the saddest passages of scripture that I've read is in the book of Ephesians. Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus and a lot of these Gentiles, you see, not Jewish, but Gentile, in his time were coming to Christ. And their life was very different than the Jewish people who were coming to Christ who had been religious. The Gentiles didn't have that kind of religion. And Paul uh, writes to them and he says, remember, that at that time, that time meeting before you came to Christ and experienced a new birth, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel. You see, you're not, you're not Israelites, you're Gentiles. So you're excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. How horrible that is, without hope. The point, of course, this morning is God has begotten us again into a lively hope. He has offered to us through Jesus Christ to cleanse all of our sin. For he has said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in that cleansing, we're reconciled to him. We're restored in our relationship to God. We now find his grace, his mercy, his love and peace at work in our hearts. And that gives us hope in a world where so many are hopeless. We recognize that marvel. Well, what, how, how do you describe hope? I mean, there, there, is, there are a lot of people that hope, and they're working on hoping. Well, this hope, this gift of God we're talking about is characterized by trustful anticipation. I like that definition. Trustful anticipation. I'm trusting God, and through that trust, I can anticipate tomorrow. You know that song that was very, very popular some years ago, uh, in which the line says, uh, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Well, you see, there's something better here. There's a hope. Because he lives, I look forward to tomorrow. Because I know God goes before me. 
and I know the one who could have power to transfer my life is leading me step by step. Isn't that beautiful? That's God's love reaching out to you and giving you that kind of hope. A definition I read recently, favorable and confident expectation. I know God's going to be at work tomorrow. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know he's going to be at work tomorrow because God is infinite. He has no yesterday. He has no tomorrow. He is one eternal now. And by virtue of that, I know that God is in control of all of my tomorrows. It's the happy anticipation of good. God's going to do something unique beyond human effort and comprehension. That hope is amazing. <laughs> amazing. In 1637, there was a great plague. As I was reading about this, I thought how appropriate it is for us today as we experience this great plague. There was a pastor by the name of Rod, uh, Martin Reinhardt. It said in his biography that he actually cared or conducted over 4,000 funerals. I can't, I can't imagine that, 4,000 funerals. But people dying, and he was always moving around trying to help families and conducting the funeral services. And the services in that day were not like they are today, and, and the disposition of bodies and so forth was unlike what we have today. In the midst of all of that, he conducted the funeral of his own wife because the disease struck his family. In 1637, Martin Reinhardt wrote these words. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices, who wondrous things hath done in whom the world rejoices, who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Does that sound like someone that's hopeless? But he's writing that in the midst of all of that. All praise and thanks to God the Father now be given, the Son and him who reigns with them in highest heaven, the one eternal God whom heaven and earth adore, for thus it was, is now, and shall be evermore. That's a person who has real hope. You can tell that. The living hope of uh, Peter here, though, is the result of the new birth. But it's the expectation that grows out of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now I have a hope that is looking forward to the fact that he that redeemed me and is risen from the dead has told me that I'm also going to rise again one day to be with him in eternity. That's our hope. I move about just a little. I try to conform to all of the rules and regulations that have been imposed upon us at this particular time. I think they're wise and good, but I do move about a little bit, and I think of the fact that we don't know how or when or where we might attract this virus into our system. And if it happens, should it happen, would my hope dissipate? I don't think so. At least I would hope not. Because the confidence of hope that we have is because at work in our lives today is the power of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians, Paul says that power at work in you is the same power that brought Jesus Christ back to life. That's powerful, isn't it? 
But that power is at work in you. And so you see, having been born again, and then seeing that he is risen from the dead, and through that, now that power is at work in us, we can move ahead with hope. We anticipate, Peter says, an inheritance. An inheritance. And he says, this inheritance is different than any other. I've been told that um, whenever you open a will, you can be pretty sure that all the family will gather. Except, I don't think my family is excited about that because probably the only thing they'd find is we have to pay all of his debts now that he's dead. That wouldn't be too profitable, you say. But they say that, you know, you have a will and, and that will commits to you whatever the person who has died has left for you. Well, he says to us, we have an inheritance. But this inheritance is secured for us because it's the result of having been born again into the family of God, which means you're his child. And it means having experienced that resurrection of God through his power at work in you, you know that you have an inheritance. And Peter puts it this way. That Peter, he says, it is an inheritance that will not fade. It, it, it's secure. It's one that you can count on being yours. Permanent, eternal, and secured. Some years ago, I was at a Bible conference where I was teaching each morning and evening, and the man leading the music, directing the choir and the congregation, uh, had cancer. We knew this going into the conference. I knew him from previous conferences where he had worked with me and had led music. And uh, getting to the conference, I anticipated seeing him because they said, well, he'll be able to be at the conference to lead singing, he said. So I talked to him, and I said, it's wonderful you could be here. He said, well, the doctor actually told me I've only got a couple of more months to live. And he said he suggested that I not come. Uh, the doctor said, you ought to save your energy. He said, doctor, if I do go and direct the music, uh, how much time will that take off of my life. He said, well, I would think you could live to the end of the year, but he said, if you're going to go and do that kind of thing, you might not make it through September and October. He was really in pretty bad condition. He said, well, for the sake of two months, I'm going to go lead the music. I've been doing it there for years. And so Ben Jenkins was there, and I saw him, and we talked some, and he told me about his situation. One evening, it was late, I was walking about. Sometimes I, my energy level doesn't allow me just to lay down and go to sleep. I gotta walk it off. And I'm walking around late. The lights, for the most part, were out, but I saw some people in the tabernacle area where we do the teaching, and they were down at the altar rail, old-fashioned place of prayer. And I looked and I realized it was Ben and his wife and his daughter, and they were praying. And so rather than going down and disturbing them, I went through some of the pews, and he looked up and he said, Jimmy, come on over and pray with us. So I did. While we were kneeling there, a few moments of silence, and I looked at Ben, and I said, Ben, do you really believe God's going to heal you? the particular denomination that he was affiliated with believed in healing. Ben looked at me and he's a little fella and he'd lost so much weight, I don't know that he weighed 100 pounds and his cheeks were sunken but he had these 
big dimples when he smiled and he said, Jimmy, I can't lose. Either I get a new body here or he's going to give me a new body there. But whichever way I go, I'm a winner. The hope that we have, born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, confident of an eternal inheritance, is ours because whichever way we go, God says, you're a winner. And that's our hope today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the confidence we can have. You've demonstrated your power beyond our comprehension, Lord. We've We've experienced your life because you're risen and you're with us. And we thank you, Father, that that hope is ours. In an hour such as we live, where there's so much desperation and fear, grant that we who are your children may so live in the light of hope that the world can see the difference Speak to hearts, Lord, even those who may be watching this. As their heads are bowed and their eyes are closed and they're examining their hearts, may they be certain that they've experienced that new birth and that they possess that hope that will not fade, that's eternal, that's secure. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is one that I think expresses very clearly the truth we've been talking about. And some of you who may be watching this probably don't even need a hymn book. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
receive now the benediction. And I would like to suggest you just extend your hands as if you were about to receive something, because you are. The benediction is that which God called Aaron to give to the people of Israel as a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his 